It is February the 2nd, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. And here we are again with episode 122 of Curiously Polar. Ah, it is. Um, hey, and uh, hello, hello, Henry. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> almost forgot you there. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. Ah, uh, me too, me too. Um, it, it seems that okay. Let's not jinx it, but it seems that the technology is with us. The internet is with us today. So the last episode, some of you might have noticed if you watched the video that Henry turned into a slideshow in the middle <laughs> and then <laughs> stayed at one frame per second, which. Um, at least we could hear you. So it's like a bit of a robot thing going on there. So sometimes it's just much better to stay with the audio podcast. <laughs> the audio is audio, much, much simpler. Absolutely much, much simpler to record than video. And uh, yeah, but anyway, we are uh, bringing you another episode of our news update because <laughs> there is news and news and news. And I'm... I think it makes it interesting. It gives the show some continuity, right? Uh, and, and some some current interest. I like that because then uh, the, that stuff is interesting. And I think um, people want to come back and hear what's going on with our favorite iceberg and so on and so on. We so, might need to turn that into a proper news show with nice animations and, and <laughs> titlings and stuff. As if I had nothing else to do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, maybe maybe get the donations turn uh, uh, rank up, ramp up, and then we can um, afford to hire out some graphics work. <laughs> this episode, this show needs a, a graphics overhaul anyway. But here we go, one twenty two, titled "Logistical Extravaganza." Before we get to that, a few um, yeah, a few news items. Um, we got an email. Uh, from Guillermo from Santiago de Chile. <clears throat> Remember, we talked about the earthquake in um, what was it, South Shetland Islands? Exactly, yeah. And uh, and then Chile was kind of well, not quite evacuated, but uh, stuff was going on there. They, they got were messages. A warning. Yeah, exactly. They got a warning. Off. And and Guillermo from Santiago de Chile, he he wrote an email, and uh, I. I I found it rather funny, and I asked him if we, I could read it on the show, and he said, sure, no problem, go ahead, do that. So um, he writes, so living in Santiago, really funny thing happened with the earthquake last Saturday. This is the sequence. First, the earthquake happens in Antarctica. Second, no one feels anything in the Chilean mainland. Third, Chilean government sends the following message to our phones. Okay, this is verbatim. Please leave coastal areas COVID emergency. And it, it literally, literally said, said COVID, COVID emergency. emergency. <laughs> in, in the, okay, nothing to do with COVID, but hey, leave the coastal areas because, I don't know, a COVID tsunami is coming or something like that. <laughs> next, next step in the sequence. People get confused, but take it humorously because it was sun Saturday night, we were drinking, and the government is run by idiots. His words, not mine. Um... Next step in the sequence. Another earthquake happens a few minutes later, a 5.9, I think, in Mendoza, near Santiago. People start freaking out, wondering how the system knew before the earthquake <laughs> actually happened. Everyone starts ringing family members on vacation at the beach. It's summer here. Next step. Chilean government sends the following message again to our phones. Please leave coastal areas COVID emergency. <laughs> Then the news breaks about the Antarctica earthquake, massive confusion. People start sending memes about what's happening. And the last step in the sequen sequence, resume drinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can, can literally imagine the confusion after the earthquake happened in, um, or in Mendoza. <laughs> people are just like, how this could is, they possibly <clears throat> know? This is, yeah. I, I, yeah, so... so um, there are there are uh, earthquakes and, and new ones actually since. In yeah, there, there is quite some activity, and we've seen a number of earthquakes around five, five point two, five point three, um, south of uh, Elephant Island. So pretty much the same area which we talked about last week. So we see some um, activity going on in that rift zone, and at the same time, I uh, follow some. Um, discussions or yeah, more like jokes um, from from polar guides, or maybe next time when we come back, there is a new island. 
Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, at, at least it's far from humans, right? Yeah, so. at least at the moment, it's uh, quite quite some distance. Yeah, it's fifty-five probably, kilometers from Elephant Island. It's yeah. probably scaring some penguins down there, <laughs> and whales probably. And whales. Anyway, how how does how does an earthquake feel for a mammal in water? Uh, if you swim and there's an earthquake. Well, earthquakes also come with um, acoustic shockwaves, and um, ah, as we okay. learned in school, acoustic travels much farther and is much louder underwater because water is much denser than air. So that might feel very uncomfortable in the area. Okay. But it also fights over time, so it's uh, not that you um, get a, a blast um, eardrum um, in Santiago when an earthquake mm. in Antarctica happens. Okay. So next uh, bit of news: the um, our our favorite iceberg A sixty eight has we haven't covered it in a while, haven't we? Well, things are well, but things are happening. That's interesting. So A sixty eight started breaking up, and we uh, explained that when an earth uh, when when an ice not earthquake iceberg when an iceberg breaks up, it. Um, it gets letters added, added, so there's an A sixty eight A and a B and a C, and it, it starts getting smaller and breaking up the moment it runs up a ground or does other things. So, um, of course, it's also melting in places and so on and so on. Um, uh, fill us in. What? Where are we now in the alphabet? <laughs> <laughs> we are far down the road. Uh, we're already at M. So A sixty eight A has Let's like see. twelve brothers or new brothers now. So this humongous iceberg just really um, got cut through with uh, seawater like a knife through butter. And that's so something the, that <clears throat> the US Nick, the US National Ice Center, has maps of like the L up to L, and then is another one that shows it up to M. So this is the state of our beloved A68 right now. It's and really if you see the video, becoming smaller the, and smaller. The big triangle on the left side, that's the remains of I68A. So that's the largest remains which continue with the original name and all the other um, break-off parts above a certain size get new names and new letters um, appointed. And you can see that <clears throat> the iceberg just broke off basically in the middle um, along its um, yeah. Um, yeah, length and um, has formed a number of very thin, very long icebergs, so very long parts. And they just formed um, along those uh, lines. I, I remember when we talked about iceberg I-68A in detail, we saw where it came from, from last night's shelf, and we got a close-up of the ice stream ending in the ocean. And you could see on the ice stream those crevasses uh, formed by the motion of the ice um, moving over the backdrop. And you can literally follow the break of the iceberg along those predetermined lines, of course, um, accelerated by the force of the Southern Ocean, which actually just pulls and pushes on each side of that iceberg so it has kind really of show, it kind of shows the direction of the forces the shearing forces that uh, must have been at play here from probably the currents and yes. it is um yeah it's getting smaller, smaller and still and still remember the the just to give you a sense of scale there has to be a minimum surface of i don't know how many square kilometers I think, um, was it, wasn't it 50 square kilometers something along 50 so <laughs> so uh, they, they must be really sizable to be allowed a letter designation exactly. and if and if this continues i mean this is so big that i will i will put a bet on the table right now that we are going to run out of the alphabet because they all the sizes that will <clears throat> that will break off will still be big enough to get a, their own letter. We are at M now. M O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. That's like thirteen more letters. So, but that's um, pretty much then just continuation, like on an Excel spreadsheet. Then you start with double A and um, no, that's B A and so on. So if something carves off, for example, of I sixty eight L, then it will be A sixty eight L A. LB uh, and so on uh, because you also it's it's not really boring it, it gives you also uh, a possibility to track where this piece originated from 
So it, it's kind of a like a family tree, if you like. I was I was just hoping there would be a bit more imagination, like using Greek letters or whatever. Uh, no, it, anyway. has to, it has to be accessible for all people in the world, yeah. and some are not very <laughs> well, science. knowledgeable. Science. <laughs> It's science. Um, the funny thing else? is, a friend of mine, um, Birgit Lutz, said that um, the smaller break-offs that didn't get appointed names are still possibly the size of a ship or even larger. That just to give you a scale of that humongous piece shattering yep. into smaller pieces, and even the smaller pieces are it's still humongous yeah, mind-blowing mind yeah. yeah absolutely mind-blowing another thing that is mind-blowing is um we had a bunch of live talks by the clothing manufacturer shackleton and uh, we pointed towards that in our last episode and uh, it um and we weren't sure if those things would be online after the fact they are now over the live talks are over but they are online and it has been really great on. talks um so so i've been listening to a number of them and i'm really really happy to see that they're online now um so we will put the, sh uh, the link in the show notes so you can find all the talks from the past week and you can just yeah, zoom in there it's really great. also the the, the 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 splash screens the thumbnails are nice photos as well just going over that web page um some amazing photography there yeah and you have the the um architect of halley station who has all it's yeah. called uh, a talk also really great amazing so that's uh, going to be in the show notes of course <sighs> and that's the news for today we should have no, a jingle episode like 122 no just kidding <laughs> thanks for joining <laughs> we'll be back in it no this um this is um we need a news a news jingle or an end of news jingle to separate these things if someone is good with that let us know. Um, so the logistical extravaganza. What, yeah, what does that actually mean? About? What 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 does it um, trigger in your imagination? Well, the getting to the well, we're still in the Antarctic apparently. So um, getting to the Antarctic isn't as easy as just going hopping on a plane and leaving and then being there uh, but it, it is a series of uh, different kind of modes of transportation you have to go through and uh, it gets probably even more difficult if you need to get equipment and food and supplies and stuff down there so I, exactly. I would expect this episode to be about just that um, it will be about that but we will of course have also a, a nice little twist because already in regular times um, as you said, just going to Antarctica already is kind of a huge achievement. It's not that you have like um, a commercial airports um, in Antarctica and everybody just um, jumps on a plane, goes down and then just go on a skido and just go to, uh, to work. It's a little bit more complicated. So you have a number of, uh, of so-called hubs or hub cities, like for example, Punta Arenas in Chile, um, Ushuaia in Argentina. Um, you have Cape Town in South Africa, you have Christchurch in New Zealand and Hobart in Australia. And those are like the, the five big cities that actually um, give access to the continent. So through those five cities, the most, um, most parties that conduct research in Antarctica bring their stuff and their gear and their equipment. That means they just route ships down to the continent, they fly their people to those um, hub cities, and then they are either flown over to the continent, so to, to small um, runways on the ice, or they got shipped over by icebreakers. But here comes the thing. We are in a very extraordinary year, which is uh, mainly um, dominated by a, a global pandemic. And that, of course, also causes a number of travel restrictions, not only for regular folk and for commercial flights, but also, of course, for researchers traveling. And a number of, of, of states have actually closed their borders. And when you get a look on the on the map of Antarctica, you see how scattered the research facilities are. So how difficult it actually is to reach them and how to, to go there. 
And so, we have to we have to emphasize how big it is. I mean, you see the at the bottom of the map, you see the legend. Um, so th there's there's quite some distances to cover there. It is. So just to give you an idea, the, the Transantarctic Mountains, which are um, like diagonally cutting through uh, Antarctica, diverting it into East and, and West Antarctica, are the longest mountain range we have on the planet. That's just really um, incredible in size to imagine. Um, the Vostok Station is about 3,000 kilom kilometers away from the coastline. So it's a humongous piece of land we have, the ore of ice, uh, I have to say. So traveling there is extraordinary already in, in regular times. But now a number of countries have just shut down or canceled their research program um, for the time being until the pandemic has settled and regular research is possible. Others have cut down and just closed, closed partially or has just really cut down on the site, uh, on the size of research stuff, for example. And when you imagine um, big research programs, like for example, the um, US and Arctic research program, which is like the largest um, operating in Antarctica, operating McMurdo Station, which even in winter has a thousand people in that huge um, area, they needed to find a solution. So you can't fly through Chile or through um, Argentina, you can't really go through New Zealand. New Zealand actually is also very strict about that. And the main hub for the US Antarctic program is actually Christchurch in New Zealand. That was no option at a point. So the US Antarctic program <coughs> just decided to board their icebreakers back in the homeland in San Francisco and just chip down the icebreakers, including crew, staff, researchers, and um, supplies from the US. In, including helicopters. I mean, just that photo here with a, a helicopter being loaded like a piece of simple gear onto yeah, it. It's, it's, a, it's the easiest way to transport them to save fuel and I know, uh, I know. Yeah, just get them down. And this particular picture, actually, um, you will see the, um, the, the painting on the ship Royal Arctic Line is like the supply vessel in Greenland that usually goes along the Greenlandic coast. And that was particularly charted by the uh, Norwegian Antarctic program to supply material um, to the Norwegian research stations. Right. So that was a uh, interesting uh, twist there as well. But for example, the Nathaniel Palmer, which is like uh, one of the icebreakers in the um, Antarctic fleet, uh, and, and the U.S. fleet um, was just sent down to Antarctica from San Francisco. It just takes 43 days to go down to Punta Arenas, where they actually just took on more supply. They couldn't um, disembark anyone. They couldn't help on the pier to unload stuff. They actually were just really remotely um, exchanging containers and, and supply goods and then sailed down to Antarctica and just uh, conducted their research there because the research is quite essential yeah, we can't allow a gap in data that's why it's so important for a number of countries to continue their research capabilities in antarctica and another point is that some of the infrastructures need to yeah, get an overhaul need to get some updates or um already um undergone updates need to just continue. And that happened to the British Antarctic Survey, um, which updates a number of facilities, as we've seen in the past um, episodes with Halley Station on the Bronte Ice Shelf, but also Rothera um, a Research Station along the Antarctic Peninsula. So they actually chartered a regular cruise ship, um, like an expedition cruise ship, which usually would go down uh, throughout their season with guests, with passengers, and just brought in their uh, research stuff, but also construction workers to continue work on the station on a new build, uh, so-called Discovery uh, Building, which is really interesting um, to see how the priorities are settled and um, that it's a really important task to finalize there as well, because you have to remember Antarctica still is one of the most hostile places in the world. We have a very little window to conduct work there, like construction work, for example. So we need to 
use that small window of opportunity to stay in some kind of schedule to actually finish an overhaul or um, yeah, to execute some, some uh, maintenance there. And then you have, of course, uh, programs like the German Antarctic program, which is not really a German Antarctic program, but it's the Antarctic program of the um, famous Alfred Wegener Institute. And most of you will uh, remember that and the uh, polar star and icebreaker from our reports of the, the, the biggest expedition of all time, the Mosaic expedition in the Arctic, where this particular icebreaker just got frozen into the sea ice for a year and just conducted uh, research up in the north. So this icebreak had, icebreaker had a very, very short break in Bremerhaven where it turned into the yard, just got overhauled, maintained, and then sent down to Antarctica where it just sent down uh, supply and um, research stuff to the Numero 3 station, which is up on an ice shelf there as well. And in regular times, Alfred Wegener Institute's logistics would send new researchers through Cape Town, would just fly them to Cape Town, and Cape Town uh, works for them as the hub city, where they bought a smaller airplane and fly to um, to Antarctica, to the ice uh, ice shelf there, where they have to board an even smaller plane to um, your commute to um, New Mayer 3. But since those times are certainly special and we really have to, um, yeah, to consider a lot of political restrictions, the logistics department of um, Alfred Wegener Institutes needed to become very creative. And they tried actually to get on regularly scheduled flights from um, the UK to the Falkland Islands and needed to figure out that those flights are just closed as well. So they actually chartered a commercial airplane from uh, Lufthansa and just scheduled a flight, a chartered flight from Frankfurt through Hamburg and from Hamburg then all the way down to the Falkland Islands, 13,700 kilometers all the way down from the far north of Germany to almost the edge of the Antarctic Convergence. And That's a long in, flight. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a very long flight. And the only reason why that was possible is that Alfred Wegener Logistics actually came up with a very, very uh, sophisticated um, plan how to prevent um, the yeah, uh, transfer of, of COVID. So what actually happened is that all the goods needs to be uh, disinfected. The crew, the, the aeroplane crew, and I mean like the, the cockpit crew and the cabin crew needs to be in two weeks quarantine as does everybody who wants to go on the plane. And that does not only include the 92 um, stuff from the Alfred Wegener Institute, which is like 50-50 ships stuff and research scientists, but also Lufthansa needed to bring in their own technicians, their own ground personnel, their own Who also on were offloaders. in current quarantine and so on. Yeah, all of them needed to stay two weeks in quarantine <laughs> prior to that flight. That's, That's just it is a humongous effort. <laughs> so that was really celebrated in a number of media. It's not only the longest flight in Lufthansa um, corporate history. It's also the longest flight ever that has departed from uh, Hamburg Airport. It's by far not the longest flight in the world, but it is certainly an achievement for the company um, in serving the scientific purpose here to actually get um, new stuff to New Mary 3, but also to relieve the ship's stuff, the ship's crew that has been on board of the ship already since uh, mid of December and just need to be relieved, get home. So it's really amazing to see after the challenges in the Arctic, what what really almost broke down the entire mosaic expedition, how that has evolved and how the logistics department seems so easily to just juggle the balls of international um, COVID restrictions and just really enable their scientific stuff and their technical crew to just go down all the way to Antarctica. It's really amazing. And at the same time, it almost caused a diplomatic incident what? because Lufthansa actually um, applied for transfer passage through Argentinian space 
at the government of Argentina. And they said, oh, by that, Germany accepts the Argentinian claim to the Falkland Islands or Islas Malvinas. What? <laughs> and Germany needed to just really put a hold on that and just rejected that claim immediately in a, in a news report. That's just really um, outstanding oh. to say, this is has nothing to do with the ongoing uh, claim of Argentina um, in regards of the Falkland Islands, but it just shows how, how strong the tensions there still are between Argentina and the UK in terms of the Falkland Islands. There is no debate about that um, for all the Falkland Islanders. When when you're just roaming through uh, Port Stanley or when you are uh, in, in West Point or Carcassonne or wherever you are, when you talk to the people, they really are British Falkland Islanders. They consider themselves part of the British Empire. There is no question about that um, for them. However, historically, Argentina tries to um, support their claim with a number of things. And recently, those tensions have just grown up. So that was kind of no surprise uh, that Argentina would use such a um, such an incident to just uh, make some some waves in, in the international geopolitics. Pretty, pretty so, interesting. So Lufthansa has also a picture up on their website with more detail on the flight path there. Um, can you tell me what these different signs along the path are, these different yeah, you have uh, you have uh, traffic relay stations basically. Um, ah, so the okay. the um, the airplane is basically following uh, the route from one relay station to the next, and oh, has to check in and to check out, and uh, that's the so relay. This is this there. is more like air traffic control related yes. things. Okay, yes. okay, okay. It just shows the number of uh, contacts all the way down, and also shows that the uh, the, the flight was supposed. Um, that was the original planning, um, was supposed to go very close to the coastline. That didn't really happen. They cut a little short and just stayed over the uh, South Atlantic and um, went straight down to the to the Falkland Islands. So they actually also stayed out of the uh, official Argentinian airspace, um, as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah, the, the whole... The moment that uh, more than just a couple of people are involved in something, um, logistics become difficult in these times. I um, I do another podcast called The Future of Photography, where um, we are a four people panel and one of our members is a director in Hollywood. And, wow. and he, uh, Jeremiah Chechik, and he is, um, uh, he tells stories of how they managed to pull off some productions because of course you have a huge crew with uh, any any major production so um, if you if, if you if you've ever seen the uh, the credits in a Hollywood movie you have an idea how many people are involved and um, getting all those or at least the core crew with the camera people and the sound people and the whoever is needed there on set to be quarantined for a couple of weeks before they can do something that's not an easy feat especially as people I mean, people have lives, right? <laughs> that's that's like the one you, thing. You're stopping also, people's lives for a couple of weeks. When, when you have such a huge uh, team size, just imagine a company move from one shooting location to another where you maybe have to quarantine again, or you have to make sure that you have kind of a um, of, of kind of a yeah, safe channel to pass. And something similar just basically happened here. So Lufthansa just stated on their website they were bringing in the whole equipment the whole personnel required to turn around the aircraft including maintenance personnel um, ground handlers uh, all, the entire crew and all of them really needed to to stick to that um, hygiene concept and all that was necessary so the Falkland Islanders would not be in touch with anything that was flown in or the airplane itself so that also means that Alfred Wegener Institute and Lufthansa needed to figure out how to bring in the kerosene, the amount of kerosene to fly the entire Airbus back to uh, to Munich. So that's just um, quite some logistics they juggled there. So I um, have to to say some big kudos to Alfred Wegener Logistics there. Crazy, crazy. So let's see, have we covered everything? There's 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 uh, some something about a British um, UK's Antarctic research hub. Is that related to the logistics thing? I'm not sure what what's the uh, reference to. 
Well, that's that's in <laughs> that's in our notes. So I'm wondering um, how oh, that is related. Uh, that's, yeah, that's just the different term of what they actually build. Rothera Station is one of the most oh, important see, stations for, for the see. UK, and they're building this new um, or construction this new building, this discovery building, and because Rothera has become so big, they actually built um, a new pier. Um, at the station for the bigger icebreaker, um, so David Attenborough. And by that, it just functions as kind of the research hub for Antarctica for the British Antarctic okay. Survey. Yeah, gotcha. Okie dokie. So I guess that's it then for this episode. Um, lots of stuff in there. You'll have a lot of fun going through our show notes and following all the links. Um, yeah, let me see. Um, of course, I hope... We hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, we're, of course, online. If you want to get in contact, talk to us, go to our um, social media presence at Curiously Porter on the Twitters, on Insta. We have a website, curiouslyporter.com. And um, yeah, get in touch. Let us know what you think. We'll uh, come back with more interesting stuff in about a week from now. Until then, everyone, take care and uh, 